Welcome back. I think we are ready to start with the, the next lecture. Um, so it's my <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce you to Matteo, which by by now you should know very well. Um, Matteo is a, well, he's a, he's a colleague at uh, uh, DeepMind. He's uh, a staff uh, research engineer there. Um, I think a fun fact is uh, he was once uh, a student in uh, in a class that I taught at uh, Polytechnico, and uh, he's now teaching me a lot of reinforcement learning. So, you know, you never know how these things uh, work in life. <laughs> so, he studied uh, um, applied math and uh, computer science at the Polytechnico di Milano, where um, and uh, he gained a master uh, degree at UCL in uh, machine learning. Um, after some experience in startups, uh, working on topics uh, ranging from automatic summarization to the use of uh, machine learning in helicopter flight simulators, he joined DeepMind uh, to focus on RL. His uh, research interests uh, focus on the fundamentals of deep uh, reinforcement learning and uh, most recently on policy optimization uh, using both model-free and model-based appro approaches. Um, as you know, Matteo is passionate about teaching and uh, he's uh, uh, giving today uh, a talk on the uh, introduction to reinforcement learning. To you, Matteo. Thank you. Hi, Francesca. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thank you all for joining today for this uh, introductory talk on reinforcement learning. I'll be covering the fundamentals of reinforcement learning while my colleague Anna will then discuss a few more advanced topics focusing on the problem of generalization in RL. So to start, what, what do we even mean by reinforcement learning? In RL, we, we study basically the problem of a learning system or an agent that uh, must learn to act in the universe it is embedded in. And this uh, universe is what we will call the environment. And the aim of the agent is to maximize the scalar reward signal that gives it feedback about how well it's behaving in the environment. And this is typically represented by this loop where an agent receives observations and rewards from the environment and in response, it selects actions. And we'll assume that this process and this interaction will happen on a discrete loop over and over again. But the important thing to understand about this loop is that the reward signal is not a supervised signal that tells you on each step what the right action is. It's just a general feedback that may be very sparse, which means that only occasionally it's different from zero, and will often be delayed. So the action that caused some positive rewards or some negative rewards may have been selected actually many steps into the past. So for instance, if Suppose you, an agent is learning to play chess. It might be required to learn to play from a reward that is just plus one when you win, minus one when you lose, and zero throughout the game. And it will be up to the agent to figure out which action during the course of the whole game were responsible for the eventual outcome of winning or losing. And this may seem, of course, a very general description. So you may wonder, OK, but sure, this is all good. But what is the actual agent? What is the actual environment? What, what are we trying to solve? But the beauty of RL is that we actually don't care. So we, we don't care whether the agent is a robotic arm learning to manipulate and assemble objects or a computer program learning to control, I don't know, Pac-Man in the classic Atari video game. Or even a trading system that's learning to operate on the, maybe on the stock market through some API. As long as there is a scalar signal that we can latch onto and optimize for, we can deal with any of these problems in RL. And once you realize this and you truly like, you, you truly get it, it can maybe feel even a too general, a bit overwhelming. Like if agents, environments, actions, observations can all literally be anything, how can we design an algorithm capable of doing anything sensible? And the short answer is maybe that math will come to our aid, helping us expressing the concepts that we need in a precise but very general way. So what makes, uh, RL so interesting to me is that in order to, to, to perform this process of learning to act in an arbitrary environment that can you know, differ so much from each other, we actually need to equip the agent with many, many different distinct capabilities. And uh, so the first one is what we will call exploration, the process of exploring alternative courses of action so that we can learn over time how to behave. The second is credit assignment. So this is a process that I mentioned already of assigning credit for awards later in time to actions that you might have taken many steps into the past. And finally, there are the problems of function approximation and generalization. So how do we extend what we learn about some setting in the environment to maybe a new situation that we have never seen before, but 
that we can relate to something that we have learned in the, in the past. And uh, in the, in this, uh, of these three problems, the first two are fairly unique to RL, while the last is actually common throughout machine learning, although it has certain special properties in the, concept, in the context of RL. And then for the purpose of this talk, I will be touching very briefly on the first problem, and then focus mostly on credit assignment and functional approximation, and leaving to Anna to delve deeper into generalization for reinforcement learning. Hopefully, all together, we will be able to communicate at least an understanding of how, by combining suitable techniques for each of these problems, we can design these very general and holistic algorithms that can learn to act sensibly across an incredibly wide range of domains. But before I delve, delve deep into the technical details, I want to discuss a couple of guiding principles that I think are useful to keep in mind when thinking about RL and thinking about RL algorithms and relate to the kind of problems that we are interested in. And these will be very high level properties, so not particularly restrictive, but so they will help structure reasoning and, and giving direction to the research that will make sure that it's as useful as possible in the long run. So the first assumption is what I call the big world assumption. So this means that I'm typically interested in an environment that has incomparably more complexity than the agent itself. And this is trivially true when you're, we're talking maybe about a physically embodied robot interacting with the physical universe. But it's often even the case in a digital or a virtual setting. So you think, for instance, of all the complexity, the politics, the economics that seeps into the behavior of the stock market. This cannot be fully explained and understood by a simple equation, but we, we still want that if we apply reinforcement learning to this problem, it, it, the agent must be able to deal with this irreducible, irreducible complexity and, and just adapt its behavior to do as well as it's feasibly possible. And the second assumption is what I is, uh, is sometimes referred to as the aperture principle. So this, this means that the agent is not just small compared to the world, but it perceives and interacts with the world through an even smaller interface. So that at any point in time, the agent observations will typically capture only a tiny portion of the environment's complexity. So for instance, if we are considering maybe a physical robot again, this may, this may perceive the world through a camera that shows what's in front of it maybe some sensors about pos position or velocity, but it won't give uh, the agent the full knowledge of everything that is happening in the universe. It will not even be able to see what is happening behind the agent. Also, the agent actions themselves will typically be fundamentally limited. So they will be performed via a smallish set of actuators with very limited power. So our, we, we cannot expect, for instance, our agent to just reprogram the state of the entire universe to achieve its goal. It, it must figure out how to achieve them with you know, very limited uh, capacities. For instance, maybe some artificial hands to move objects in close proximity to the agents. So let's start now with the first problem. And I'll be a bit brief on this because I want to, to, to get to the, the credit assignment problems soon after. And uh, this is a problem of exploration. So imagine a rat is placed in a room with just two levers. And on each time step, the agent has only two actions it can cho choose between. Either it pulls the white lever on the top or the second lever at the bottom, where the two levers will either provide uh, food or maybe a small electric current. And we'll do so, each of them will do so with some unknown fixed probability that is different between the two. So this is the extremely simple instantiation of the RL problem. And I say it's extremely simple because each decision for the rat is fully independent from the next. So the, having chosen a lever on one step that doesn't preclude its choices on the next step. And it, the rat immediately sees the consequences of the action selection. So it's basically a bandit problem from the previous lecture. In this setting, what, what should the rat do? What is the best behavior for the rat? How can it maximize the amount of food it collects while minimizing the, the electric the current that is given? And uh, to understand how this might, might work, I'll introduce a few con fundamental concepts and then will come handy later as we will move to credit assignment. And the first concept is that of a policy. So this is how we will formalize agent behaviors. So in this case, where the rat can only choose between the same two actions, pulling one or the other lever, the policy will just be a probability distribution over these two options. And what the agent will need to do is to change over time this probability distribution, so to eventually pull the lever that provides the most food. But the critical problem of RL is that 
even in this very simplified form of a reinforcement learning, they, the rat will have to figure out how to do this from experience. It's, it doesn't know what is the likelihood of each lever to provide food. So one option maybe to find a good policy for, for this rat could be, well, let's, let's assume it's a very smart rat. It could keep track of the number of times it's selected each action so far, and maybe keep track of the sum of all the rewards collected by executing uh, each, each action, and then estimate the goodness of each action as the average reward collected by that action. If the rat was able to you know, memorize all this information, then it could act greedily with respect to the estimated goodness of the action, which would mean to select the action with the highest uh, average reward. And let's assume the rat implements this greedy policy. What, 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 what would happen? Well, let's say at the beginning, it doesn't know anything. The average reward is zero for both. So let's say it breaks ties at random and chooses the, the lever on the bottom. And it gets a small electric current, which corresponds, let's say, to a reward of minus one. What should the rat do next? Well, since it's a greedy rat, the, the average reward for the lever below is going to be negative, while the other one is still zero. So it will choose the, the, to pull the lever on the top. And this seems a reasonable choice. I probably would do the same. And this time, it gets some food. So what next? Again, if we're assuming that the rat is implementing a greedy policy, well, the average reward for the lever above is plus one. The average reward for the lever below is minus one. So presumably, it would stick with the lever above. But let's say it gets, it pulls it, and it gets uh, an electric current. And then again, and again. Remember how many times the rat gets the electric current on the top? The average reward of that lever will never reach exactly minus one, because there is this initial food at the beginning. So this means that the average reward for the lever above will always be higher than the average reward of the lever at the bottom, where we got a negative reward 100% of the times out of the one time we tried it. So the rat, if it was implementing a greedy policy, it would be stuck in this loop forever. And just being stuck in this, stuck in this loop doesn't seem very sensible. I, I presume if I was in this setting, I would at some point try the other lever. After all, we only tried it once, so it, maybe we were unlucky, and it actually provides more food and less shocks than the other one. The problem of exploration is, is when, at what point should the try, rat try the black lever again? How should we update the policy to ensure that we explore different options and we understand different options before committing to one? And this is basically critical also to the bandits problems that were discussed by Professor Chesabianchi in the previous lecture. They, they amount to trading off what we call often exploration and exploitation. So collecting rewards based on our current knowledge of the environment versus exploring courses of actions that might seem suboptimal now, but that could turn out to be even better than expected if we did try them. So one option to alleviate the problem in the previous example would be maybe instead of being a fully greedy rat, we could introduce a bit of noise in the policy. So for instance, we could use an epsilon greedy policy. This is one that instead of that selects the most promising actions most of the time, but then picks another action at random, at least with some small probability epsilon at every step. This would find a better trade-off between exploration and exploitation because it would ensure that all actions are occasionally tried, preventing the agent to prematurely converging on a suboptimal action, but it would still pick the most promising action, at least in the majority of the steps. Is this enough? Uh, well. The, the short answer no, is no. So as you, you, you heard also in the in Professor Chesabianchi lecture, online learning is, of course, a very hard problem. And the epsilon greedy policy is far from the optimal solution because, sure, exploring is good. But once we have a really good estimate of which is the best lever to pull, we would want to actually um, stick with that one and not continue or occasionally pull a random lever. And things indeed can be improved in many ways. So the simplest thing would be maybe decay the amount of noise epsilon over time. So that our, our agent, or our rat in this case, would explore at the beginning, but then become greedy in the limit as it has gained more knowledge of the environment. And this could be fairly effective, but it, it does require to tune quite carefully the schedule. And there are, of course, also more principled solutions, especially in this simplified reinforcement learning setting, which is basically just a bandit. We, we can find the optimal traits of between exploration and exploitation. For instance, the UCB algorithm that instead of picking the action with the highest average reward so far, maximizes an upper confidence bound that is given by the sum of the average reward so far, plus an exploration term that is a function of the number of times an action has been picked so far. 
in a way that actions that have been picked only a few times receive a comparably larger bonus. This is, makes kind of intuitive sense because we expect those actions uh, estimates to be more uncertain and therefore warrant more exploration. And uh, I, I don't want to go into too much details on this because, uh, of course, exploration is a huge problem. And I will actually want to get to the second fundamental problem of RL, which is credit assignment. And credit assignment comes along when we actually try to deal with the sequential nature of most of decision making. So in this rat example, each action and each decision was basically independent of the previous one. But it's not the case in most settings. Typically, the actions that you choose early on in, in your training process may constrain, for instance, the observations that you see and the options that you will have uh, later on. And in the, also, because as we said, rewards could be very delayed, we need the mechanisms to assign credits for a reward to actions that might have been selected many, many steps before. And the dealing with the sequential structure of decision making is what is the fundamental topic of credit assignment in RL. To deal with this problem, we actually need to extend the concept of policy, as we had defined it before, and actually introduce also several new concepts. So for, for the concept of policy, what we need is uh, something that is still defines the probability distribution over actions, so that we can sample from this probability distribution and to, to, to generate behavior and interact with the world. But we will need this probability distribution to be conditioned on the history of the past observations. As you remember from the initial slide, we have this continuous loop where the agent receives observations from the environment, selects actions in, retur in return, and gets a new observation and a new reward. And the right way of behaving typically depends on this history of past observations. So what, how can we condition over the history of observation? If you, if you think about it carefully, this, this is an ever-extending sequence of events. So, is, is probably computationally intractable for any practical purpose. We'll never be in the same place again, and we will never be able to process at all every time we need to select a new action. So what we need is to introduce an additional concept to that of policy, and this is the notion of a state. By this, we mean some summary of the history of observation. And this could be just the last observation. This is perfectly fine in a lot of environments that are called uh, fully observable. So for instance, if you're learning to play chess, you only need to observe the board at the given point in time to know what to do next. So the latest observation is already a valid state that you could use to condition your policy on. But in general, the state might be some iterative aggregation of the latest observations. So that on each step, you will have some procedure that takes the previous state and the latest observation and integrates the information to a new state representation. The reason we want the process of aggregating information to be recursive is that this allows us to keep computational, uh, the computational cost fixed. And for instance, this aggregation procedure could be parameterized by a recurrent neural network and learn from data. This, this actually is the case in a lot of um, modern RL agents, but it could also be hard coded. So you could have the environment itself provide you with some suitable state or state. What matters is that wherever, whenever, wherever the state comes from, policies and other agent predictions will now be a function of state instead of a full history, and therefore will be computationally tractable. And we will assume in all the following that we have such a notion of state and we have a finite set of state in our problem. Once we have this notion of a policy conditioned on state, the agent's objective is to change this policy. And the objective is to find the not what is called an optimal policy. So this is a behavior that maximizes the cumulative discounted rewards for any given state from there onwards. And in this expression, there is this discount factor gamma, which is actually critical because it modulates the relative importance of immediate versus distant rewards. So for instance, if the discount is zero, the agent will only care about maximizing the reward on the first step immediately after the action would basically be more similar to a bandit problem. But as the discount problem discount becomes closer and closer to one, then the agent will be less and less myopic and care more about rewards that come far into the future. In some settings, this discount factor might be already defined by the environment itself. There might be a natural choice. So for instance, in a financial setting, the inflation rate may define a natural way of discounting future rewards. 
But even in this case, the agent might still choose to optimize a different discount. So it's good to think of this discount as the property of the agent, of the objective that the agent chooses to optimize for. Because sometimes, for instance, it might be easier to learn about a, a smaller discount, and even though it makes the agent more myopic, and then maybe being very good at this myopic proxy objective might be better than trying and then failing to optimize the true undiscounted objective or with a very high discount. Another important thing about the return is that if the environment or the agent policy are stochastic, which is very often the case, or if there is partial observability, uh, this return will actually be a random variable. So to make the objective more precise and be able to optimize it, we'll need to choose some statistic of the return that we then optimize. Typically, the opt objective will be formulated as maximizing what is the expected value of the return. That was, is also referred to as the value of, of a policy. And it's good to point out that the value is always dependent on the agent policy itself, because the expected amount of reward you can collect from a state onwards obviously depend on how the agent will behave in the future steps. So for this reason, we'll specify as a superscript of the, of the value function what is the policy uh, that they refer to, at least when, when there might be one more, no, more than one policy of interest. And then a final thing that is good to realize about the return and the values is that expected values are not the only choice. So we could choose to optimize an agent's behavior for a different statistics of the return. For instance, we might want to be able to pick how sensitive the agent to risk or minimize the variance. In some cases, we may care, for instance, more about categorically avoiding catastrophically bad outcomes than we care about pushing a little bit more up the average. And this can actually be an extremely important and useful thing to consider in many real-world applications. So we can also define a, a related concept that will be critical actually later on, and this is the concept of an action value. So these look just like state values, but they condition the expectation also on the first action. And as for values, they also depend on the, on the policy of behavior after this first action, hence the superscript by. And among all possible action values, we will be especially interested in what we call an optimal action value. So this corresponds to the action values under the best possible behavior for the agent. So this will be particularly important because if we can estimate the optimal action values, then we can construct an optimal policy of behavior and therefore fully solve the reinforcement learning problem. In general, estimating values, whether they are you know, state values V or the action values Q, uh, will be a critical part of many RL algorithms, but depending on the specific algorithm, we might be interested in different flavors of value estimation. So the first type of value estimation is, is known as prediction or policy evaluation. And this is the problem of estimating the value of all states for a fixed given policy phi. The second type of value estimation is known as a control problem. Here we want to estimate the optimal values, therefore the values of the best possible policy that the agent could follow because this will give us a way to solve the RL problem. So let's start with the first problem. This is policy evaluation. We want to evaluate what the value is of any state in the environment for a fixed policy by. And to understand how we can solve this problem, we first need to highlight one another important feature of the returns, which, is, which we'll be reusing over and over, and is the fact that the return is a sum of the discounted rewards, and that you, if you factor out the gamma after the first reward, then you can trivially rewrite it as in a recursive form as the immediate reward plus the discounted return from that state onwards. And because of the linearity of all terms, this still holds true if you add an expectation, which means that the expected amount of rewards that you can collect, the value, also admits a recursive decomposition, where the value in a state is the expectation of the immediate reward plus the value discounted of the next state. And this is uh, under an expectation, so it's weighted by the likelihood of selecting the immediate actions according to the policy, and also the likelihood of reaching future states, the, the next state, when executing that action in that environment. And this recursive decomposition of values is what is known typically as a Bellman equation. So the solution to the Bellman equation will be a vector containing the value under the policy pi for all states. So it will actually be the answer to policy evaluation. But but how do we find this solution? So the first thing we could do is to manually unpack the expectations under the policy pi and under the environment transition dynamics d to rewrite the Bellman equation as a system of n equations in n variables 
that in matrix form would read as V equals R plus the discounted transition probabilities pi times V, where R is the vector of expected rewards from each state under policy pi, and the matrix P is the matrix of transition probabilities from any state to any other state under policy P and under the, the environments that you are interacting with. So once written in this way, and if we could write it in this way, we could trivially solve the system, for instance, with basic linear algebra, the solution being the inverse of the identity minus the discounted transition matrix times the expected reward vector. The obvious problem of this is that obviously this is computationally intractable, even for a small problem. So the solution has a cost that is cubic in the number of states. And, and we always remember, we want to solve this problem in the context of a big world. So a setting where we have a huge amount of states. So as an alternative, we could turn to dynamic programming. So this is a popular family of algorithms based on a very simple but incredibly nice idea, which is that we can initialize our estimates of the value of each state to some arbitrary value, let's say zero, and then turn this Be the Bellman equation from the previous slides into an update and just iterate this update until convergence. So to be very concrete, at each iteration, this would amount to sweep over all the states in the, that, in the environment, assign as new value of each state, the result of computing the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, and then repeating the process over and over until the Bellman equation is actually satisfied. So choosing to use dynamic programming is definitely more appealing than the previous solution because it reduces computational cost significantly. But there are quite a few things I want to point out about this approach. So the first is that in each, um, in each update, we're basically using our previous estimate of the values to compute our new better estimate. So this process where we continuously refine our values by using our previous best estimate is what we will call bootstrapping. And it might seem almost magical that this would even work at all, but it can be formally proved that it does converge to the right solution and amazingly for arbitrary initializations. And the second notable thing is that we still have to compute this expectation. And this might be expensive if we have a very large number of states which again goes against our big world assumption. But even more importantly, it requires to know not just the agent's policy, which is part of the agent, so it's fair game, but it also requires to have a complete specification of the environment dynamics. So for instance, we would need the, to have the, maybe a transition matrix and the specifying what, for, with what probability the agent transitions from any one state S to any possible other state. And this, this is just unacceptable in reinforcement learning. So we, we want algorithms that can learn in completely arbitrary environments for which we do not know the actual dynamics. So what shall we do? Well, a more general approach is implemented by temporal difference learning algorithms. So the, the idea here is that we can sample the expectations from dynamic programming by computing those same updates on the actual state that the agent encounters when interacting with the environment. This will be an unbiased sample of the visitation distribution. And as in dynamic programming, this would then amount to um, sweep over states, but not all states in order, but over the states that we actually encounter when interacting with the environment, and then update, compute a new value for any state we encounter as the immediate reward that we encountered when taking a given action in that state plus the discounted value of the state we actually saw when executing that action. And again, the process can be repeated until convergence, but we doesn't require now to compute any expensive expectation, nor it requires to know anything about the environment dynamics. This is, can now be treated as a full black box. As long as we can interact with the world, we can apply this temporal difference algorithm. The problem with applying this temporal difference algorithm in this naive form is that this update can be very noisy if the environment is stochastic or the policy of the agent is stochastic. So we'll actually need a final small modification, which is to update the values incrementally in small steps. And then the algorithm would look still very similar to before. And you can see the same uh, bootstrap target, R plus gamma V from the previous slide. But now on each, every time we visit a state, we only take a small step alpha in, direction, in the direction of this target so that the estimate of the value will then correspond to an exponential moving average of all the previous visitations of that state as we were interacting with the environment. And this is now actually practical and popular algorithm, which is known as TD0. So 
An, an interesting thing is that this same line of reasoning that we did for values, we can also follow for action values of a policy pi. This will look very much like the previous algorithm with only a slightly different temporal difference algorithm. This is known as the SARSA algorithm and it looks exactly like TD. It, it uh, operates by just interacting with the environment, but now updates action values. So we'll have a vector of size, number of states times number of actions. And we will update each state and action pair that we select, that we execute in the environment by using, again, a bootstrap target, but that then bootstraps not on the value function, but on the action value function itself. And this is called SARS, and we'll solve the, pro the same problem, policy evaluation, so evaluating the value of fixed policy, but we'll give you the action values instead of the state values. So why is the estimating values useful in the first place and why is it especially useful to estimate action values? The reason is that given values for some policy, we can construct a so-called greedy policy that selects in any state the action with the highest value. And importantly, the values for the greedy policy are gonna be equal or higher to the values of the original policy in all of the states. And they will only be exactly equal if the policy is optimal. And this is a fundamental insight because it means that if we, we can start with an arbitrary policy, estimate its values, construct a greedy policy with respect to these values, and repeat this process over and over. And at each iteration, we will have a better policy. And this is not just a nice property in abstract. It's, it's basically a direct recipe for designing algorithms that can solve not just policy evaluation, but that by iterating this process and alternating it with policy improvement by doing a, a greedy step, then we can solve the, the, the control problem, so find the optimal values and the optimal policy, which is the ultimate objective of our own. So this recipe is shown more visually in this graph and is typically referred as the policy iteration algorithm. As you can see here, the algorithm starts with some initial action values, Q0, defines the policy to be greedy with respect to these, then performs a full policy evaluation to get a new set of action values. This could be done using SARSA, for instance the simple temporal difference algorithm I described in previous slides. And then we can define a new policy as the greedy policy with respect to Q1. And its evaluation will give us again a new set of action values Q2. And as we proceed on each iteration, the policies, each policy is better than the previous one until the action values converge to the optimal values. And therefore acting greedily with respect to those values gives us the optimal policy. So you might worry that there are at least a couple though of caveats that I need to that we need to basically take care of to make sure that this actually works. So the first thing is you might worry that running a complete policy evaluation to convergence before each policy improvement step might be too slow. And indeed it can be. So luckily we don't actually need to do this. So we don't need to run policy evaluation to convergence. What we can do is to always act greedily with respect to the latest value estimates immediately after each single update to the values. So this process would be depicted in, in this plot where we only take partial steps towards evaluating the policy and then immediately act greedily with respect to the new set of action values. And the second caveat is, under what circumstances would this converge to the optimal solution? Can we guarantee that it does? And the answer is that we need a, a couple of, 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 small, of, of small things to take care of a couple of small, of small things. So as we discussed in the rat example all the way at the beginning, also in this sequential setting, we need to ensure that we don't prematurely converge to a suboptimal solution. So by acting greedily with respect to an initially inaccurate value estimate, we could also in this setting lock ourselves into a suboptimal policy that never tries certain more valuable actions, therefore never learns about these more valuable actions, and therefore cannot converge to the optimal solution. And the fix to ensure convergence is the same we discussed in the RAT example. So to do the policy improvement, with some noise using an epsilon greedy policy that on each step picks a random action with some small probability epsilon to ensure that we continue to explore different courses of action. In order, if we do this, then to actually make sure that, that we converge, uh, we also need to de then decay the epsilon parameter to zero over time, because otherwise we will not converge to the optimal policy, but, a, but, a, but a, an epsilon greedy policy with respect to the optimal values. And, uh, and this can be done easily with, for instance, a schedule. But we will need to make sure that we decay it slow enough that we would still visit all state action pairs infinite times if we were to run the algorithm forever. So this means we need the decay, for instance, one over T. Uh, 
And uh, finally, as an additional technical condition, we'll also need to decay the step size alpha that is used in the updates to the values, uh, just to make sure that the moving average basically can settle on a value by using a bigger and bigger horizon as time proceeds. So this works, and it's actually a great algorithm that is used often in practice. But it has some limitation. The, the main one being that it's what is called a non-policy algorithm. So it estimates the values of a policy pi that is used to interact with that same environment. But, but in RL, we can also estimate values of policy. So for a policy new that is different from pi, that is different from the one that generates the data. And of policy learning is useful for many reasons. First of all, it allows to learn about the optimal policy while still using a more exploratory policy to act. So for instance, Q-learning shown on this slide allows to learn about the greedy policy while acting according to the epsilon greedy policy. This is a Q-learning achieves this with a, just a very tiny modification from the SARS update. It just uses R plus the discounted max value on the next state as the bootstrap target instead of R plus the, disc the discounted value of the action selected by the policy. And this is nice because with this tiny change, we can relax also the convergence conditions of the estimate to this of the estimates to the optimal policy by not requiring to make the behavior of policy greedy in the limit as we required for SARSA. And additionally, of policy learning opens up a huge number of, uh, of interesting avenues where, for instance, we could learn what by exploiting human data or historical data by updating the agents of policy on this data. And this can be extremely useful in settings where data generation is expensive, for instance, in a robot acting in the physical world, or unsafe for any reason. So all the algorithms so far are known as tabular algorithms. What do I mean by tabular algorithms? It means that we they still work by storing the value estimates for each state, or in the case of action values, each state and action pair separately. And if you remember, we, we care about a big world. So while you know, this is, is linear in the number of states, which is not too bad, it's still not scalable to really, really large complex problems. So in order to actually take these algorithms and make them feasible at a large scale, we need, to, we need a way to generalize what we learned about one state to other states. Luckily, though, this is a very well-studied problem in machine learning, and it's basically a problem of function approximation and generalization. So we, what we need is to then combine this literature about function approximation with RL ideas in order to get a fully scalable algorithm. And the key insights to, to, for applying function approximation to RL is to realize that values, or policies for that matter, are just functions. So values, for instance, map states to a scalar estimate of the cumulative reward. An action value maps state action pairs to, to a scalar estimate of the cumulative reward. And so this means that the problem of value estimation can be rephrased as the problem of finding suitable weights for a parameterized approximation of these functions. What does this mean in practice? Well, as always, when we try to fit a parameterized function, the first fundamental issue is how do we parameterize? So the simplest choice could be, for instance, to represent values as a linear function of some features. So in this case, we would have that for each state s, the value would be computed by first mapping the state to a set of features pi, and then taking an inner product with a set of parameters theta to get the actual value estimate. When using linear function for approximation, the feature choice, though, is going to be really, really critical, because linear mappings are not that expressive, so finding a good fit is critically dependent on having good features. So this might often require to handcraft features well, in a, using some sort of domain knowledge. Luckily, though, handcrafting feature is hard, uh, but we don't necessarily need to do this, this, because we can use deep learning, for instance, to let the function approximator itself learn good mappings and good, including any features that are needed just from raw sensory data. So suppose, for instance, you have a robot that acts in the world using a camera to perceive its surrounding space, then Maybe the value function may be approximated by a neural network that processes the input images using convolutional layers, then maps this intermediate representation onto values using some fully connected layers. And by making this intermediate representation, these features, part of the function approximator, then we can learn them from data together with the overall value estimates. You can also modify trivially the, the ar architecture in this plot to, for instance, parameterize an action value function. 
So this you can do this by maybe either taking the action to be estimated as an additional input to the network, or maybe by making the network output a vector of action values instead of a single scalar value. Both, both actions are actually perfectly valid. The decision between the two typically depending on computational aspects. For instance, the latter is cheaper because it allows us to generate all the values in one sweep. In both cases, though, the problem of value estimation, whether we're using a linear function approximation, deep learning, or even some new fancy uh, approximator that doesn't exist yet, we have still turned value estimation into an optimization problem, where we want to find settings for the parameters theta of the function approximator that minimize the prediction error. As usual in optimization, we then need, of course, a loss function to make, to make measurable this prediction error. And the most common choice is to measure it as the expected squared difference between the true values and our parametric estimate, weighted in the expectation by the visitation distribution of the states in the environment. If we have turned value estimation in this optimization problem, then maybe the first thing you could think of is let's just use gradient descent to solve the optimization. So for the prediction loss that we defined in the previous slide, this would correspond to taking small steps with the learning rate alpha in the direction of the gradient of the loss, which in turn is the expected difference between the true value of each state and the estimate of, our val of the value according to our function approximator times the gradient of the estimate itself. This, of course, is just the application of the chain rule to the loss in the previous slide. There is nothing particularly fancy here. The problem is that that expression of the gradient is actually hard to compute, and for two reasons. The first is that we actually don't know how to unpack the expectation because it depends on the unknown environment dynamics. And just like we discussed when we were talking about dynamic programming, in general, in reinforcement learning, we don't know the dynamics of the environment, and we don't need we, we don't want to need this. And the second problem is that even if we did, we don't know the true value of each state. So this uh, target v pi is just not available. If we had it, we wouldn't need to, to be learning it in the first place. Fortunately, we have already dealt with both these kind of issues in the previous part of the lecture. And, and the, the answer is just to sample the expectation by computing the update on the states that we actually encounter when interacting with the environment so that we get an unbiased sample of the visitation distribution. And then approximated the target value using a suitable bootstrap target from Tabular RL. So the result is an update that is proportional to a difference between our estimate and this bootstrap target times the gradient of the value estimate itself. And this is something that we can compute on each step online in a computationally effective way and use it to update our values. So let me be more concrete though. What, what would be the bootstrap term? Well, it depends on what we're trying to learn. Let's say we're trying to do policy evaluation. So we want a deep version of TD0. In this case, we could implemented by using as bootstrap target the reward we observed on the last interaction with the environment plus the discounted estimated value of the state we ended up in. This is just a bootstrap target from that we discussed in Tabura RL, but then used inside the, our gradient update and using our own parameterized estimates to bootstrap. And the result is the update in the, at the bottom of this slide. And the same mechanism can be used also to learn Q values with function approximation in a very similar way. So this would result in a, <clears throat> this would result in a deep Q learning algorithm, for instance, where we update the action value for a specific action in a specific state by using as targets the sum of the resulting reward plus the maximum action value estimate in the subsequent state, resulting in this update. One thing to note, though, is that for consistency with deep learning notation in implementations of deep reinforcement learning agents, you will actually not see the updates written as in the previous slide. You will actually typically see them written as gradients of a pseudo loss. So, for instance, you might find that the Q learning loss uh, is, uh, you might find a Q learning loss to be defined as the squared difference between our predictions for a state and action and the Q learning bootstrap target R plus gamma max Q on the next state. When you do see it written in this way, critically, the target is going to be surrounded by what is called the stop gradient. These are denoted by the vertical bars in this equation. And what they mean is that in the process of computing this loss and gradients of this loss, we should ignore the dependency on theta of the bootstrap target itself. Because only ignoring this dependency, taking the gradient of this loss results in the correct update from the previous slide. So this is a convenient notation for a number of reasons. First of all, that just matches what people are used to in deep learning. 
It allows you to combine this loss with maybe auxiliary losses. But it's good to realize that it's just a prop. It's just something that is designed to give you the right gradient when you compute it using the stop gradient. So the TD update, the temporal difference learning update, are not really the gradient of any true loss. They are stochastic bootstrap approximations of the gradient of the loss of the expectation that I defined a few slides ago. So this is a, a prop and is convenient for our practical purpose, but it's good to realize that it's not the tr a true loss. This gives us basically what we were looking for, because now we have gone all the way from um, being able to learn the values for a policy, being able to optimize the policy itself, and finally have a mechanism to generalize what we learn about some states and actions to other states of actions. So this has really brought us all the way to what is with, with the scalable and effective algorithms that you can apply to an arbitrary problem, regardless of its, uh, you know, what is the nature of its observations, re uh, rewards, regardless of which is the action space and so on. And deep reinforcement learning has indeed been incredibly effective to, to apply RL at scale, but it does introduce a few challenges. And among these, I just want to touch briefly on at least a couple. So the first being that performing optimization in RL setting is not quite as trivial as maybe I made it seem in the previous slides. And the second is that introducing generalization in RL can actually cause certain kind of instabilities. So let's start with the first one. Why is optimization in RL non-trivial? Well, the reason is that stochastic gradient descent, so training the parameters of a function approximator by gradient descent, assumes that the data is IID. And in reinforcement learning, data comes from interacting with the environment. And of course, the next state you visit is strongly correlated with the state you were in in the previous step. This means that consecutive updates are also going to be strongly correlated. And this can make the optimization process unstable in some situations. So a popular solution to this issue is to accumulate experience in a rolling buffer called an experience replay buffer, from which we sample then data uniformly instead of in order so that we break correlation or at least we reduce the correlation between consecutive updates. This idea is very simple and it simplifies optimization a lot, but it's also popular for a second reason, which is that it allows to reuse samples more than once because you might sample the same data many times uh, to do more updates to your function approximator. And this is actually quite useful and because it can improve the data efficiency of our agents, which is maybe the major concern for deep, deep modern RL systems, especially when we want to apply them in real world settings. The second challenge I want to mention on is that introducing generalization in RL is not always a safe thing to do. So for instance, reinforcement learning theory shows that Parameters could actually diverge to infinity when using what is what is called the deadly triad. This is the combination of bootstrapping, so the process of using your own estimates to construct the targets for learning, function approximation, so for instance, using linear functions or deep networks to approximate values, and of policy learning. For instance, this might be a case if we learn from past data in an experience replay or if we use an off-policy algorithm like Q-learning. And what I want to point out is that this setting, this deadly triad, is not an unusual situation to be in. So you encounter, for instance, the deadly triad when using Q-learning with deep nets and experience replay. And this is a massively popular combination of ideas. And this makes is concerning, of course, and makes investigation into stable deep RL algorithms that can work well with function approximation and of policy a very, very valuable direction of research. It's also good, though, not to overstate the case. So, Theory tells us that divergence can happen when combining bootstrapping, function approximation, and off-policy learning, but it tells us actually remarkably little about how likely we are to encounter it in practice. And even in settings where it would arise, there's many tricks that we can use to stabilize learning. So for instance, with some colleagues at DeepMind, I recently performed a large empirical study in the context of Q-learning agents and variants of Q-learning agents to understand how common divergence actually is in popular RL benchmarks like Atari, for instance. And what we found is that in practice, unbounded divergence, so where parameters actually diverge to infinity, is incredibly, incredibly rare. So what is more common is a form of what we call the softer divergence. So this is where values grow to unreasonable high values at the beginning, but then do converge back to the correct estimates. So for instance, in this plot on the right, I show the quantiles for the distribution of values across a huge number of experiments with many different variants of Q-learning 
learning on many different domains using a large variety of different network architectures. And I showed the quantile of the values. And what you can see is that, oh, as a function of time, so as, as a function of the number of steps and, and interactions with the environment. And what you can see is that a sub substantial fraction of the experiments do see values growing to unreasonable values. So for instance, orders of millions for the action values, despite the maximum true action value actually being in the order of 100. But then they do typically converge back to below 100, to 10 to the second, which is the expected level for the problems of interest. And they do so within a few million frames. So this, of course, is not to say that there is no value in investigating better, stronger, more stable algorithms, because having wildly unrealistic value estimates at the beginning of training can slow down convergence and make our algorithms less data efficient. And for instance, in, in the context of the paper where we present this empirical study, we already show that different variants of Q-learning actually are have very different profiles and might be more or less susceptible to this problem and these issues than others. So I'm sure that more ideas could help make DeepRL even more stable. But, but I want, they want to point out with this plot is that it does mean that the existence of the deadly triad in theory does not prevent DeepRL agents from being widely applicable and really effective on an incredibly wide range of problems in practice. To understand that at least, uh, um, to get at least some insight of how we could minimize, for instance, instabilities under the deadly triad, it's good to understand why the deadly triad arises in the first place. Why is it deadly? And, and the reason is that the deadly triad is ultimately an issue of inappropriate generalization. So what do I mean by this? Well, the problem is that when you update the value of a state S, by generalization, you might be inadvertently pushing up in the same direction the value of the next state S prime. And the value of the next state S prime is what we will use to bootstrap from when updating S again on the next time we visit it. And this can create a feedback loop, where as we push up the value of S, this results in even larger increases to the value uh, of S on the next time we visit it, because by pushing value S, we have also pushed up the, the bootstrap target. And this is what is cause, causes divergence. And this is also why it doesn't happen in a tabular setting, because the value estimates of each state is independent from the next state in a tabular setting. And it's also why it doesn't happen on policy, because if you are training on policy, you will immediately update the value of the next state as soon as you visit it, counteracting any inappropriate generalization. But as soon as you have generalization and you're computing your updates on a different distribution from the one that you from the visitation, from the distribution under the policy, then there is where you can get this feedback loop, and and it could in some cases parallel control. And if this is the issue, there are though many things that we can do, and I want to mention at least one very simple one, just to show how good understanding of an RL issue can directly lead to algorithmic algorithmic changes to address it. So, for instance, for the deadly triad, a popular fix is to use what are called target networks. This means that we keep two copies of the neural network used to estimate the Q values, where the parameters of one network are updated on each step. And this is the network that we use to act. But the parameters of the other network are a slow copy of the first one, only updated maybe every tens of updates or every hundred of updates. And this reduces or almost in some cases eliminates the possibility of a feedback loop, because updating the value of a state doesn't immediately affect the bootstrap target on the next visitation of that same state, because the bootstrap target is using this second delayed set of parameters that won't see the generalization until later on in training. Overall, though, uh, this is definitely not it. So there are both in, when it comes to generalization, there are many other ideas and interesting solutions to the problem. But also, in general, in deep reinforcement learning, there are so many more open problems that we, we need to make progress on. And among these, I want to just point out a few. So the first is how to explore effectively. I very, very briefly touched upon it in this talk. I mentioned, for instance, that we need to act epsilon greedily for, uh, for Q learning to converge. But the acting epsilon greedy is a very, very trivial solution. And for instance, in the, ca in the case of bandits, we know that it's not optimal. And something more sophisticated like UCB is actually optimal. What is the right way to do exploration in the sequential setting in the full general RL problem? This is definitely still a big open problem, especially in terms of what is the right way to, to do so at scale. Another open problem is how do we learn stably from massively of policy data? 
So we know, for instance, Q-learning is able to learn off policy. But for instance, as we combine it with the, with the neural networks, we might have deadly tried issues and certain instabilities. How can we minimize this kind of instabilities to be stable even if we learn from data generated from a totally different policy? Another huge problem is what are the right neural network architectures for deep reinforcement learning? Because the main, I wouldn't say the main, but a lot of the big advances in machine learning and in deep learning have come from being able to encode the right inductive biases in our neural network. So for instance, in computer vision, at the beginning of the week, Naila talked about how pooling and convolutions allow you to encode a form of translation invariance in your network that is really nicely suited for vision, and that's led to the massive uh, success of the neural network for visions. And similarly, um, we encode the different inductive biases and different uh, like innate structure in the networks that we use for uh, natural language processing, like in transformers that were described by Aaron. By and uh, the question is then, what are the right inductive bias? What is the right structure for a neural network that is used for deep RL? What is the right inductive bias for something that estimates values, not uh, predicts labels? And this is uh, a hugely open problem that I think we will need to make a big progress on and that has received re remarkably little attention in the context of RL, because often people have been mostly just taking out of the box deep learning architectures from, from maybe vision in, in a large part. And finally, a, a huge topic is how to make these algorithms more data efficient. Like a lot of these solutions are incredibly powerful, but do consume a, a lot of data. So I touched on one, one idea that can help and is used in practice to improve data efficiency. And this is the use of experience replay, but it's not the only one. So there is a huge, for instance, the research area in DeepRL about using networks to model the environment itself and then use this model of the environment to perform additional updates that do not require to interact with the world and therefore can help converge much faster while inter re requiring just few interactions with the environment. And there are many others, but these, I think, are the most important problem, open problem in RL. And um, I really look forward to at least some of you, hopefully, contributing to our understanding of these issues in, uh, in future years. And uh, to conclude, I just want to leave you with some references. So the first is the Reinforcement Learning book by Rich Sutton in its 2018 edition. So this is available online for free. And it's really the book for reinforcement learning. I, I every time I you know, check it out and read something, I, I discover something I didn't know, and that and it's just explained in the most amazing way. And also, I added a couple of you know seminal papers in reinforcement learning that include uh, the original paper on difference temporal difference learning by Sutton himself, uh, Q learning the year after, and also a couple of more recent ones. So the famous DQN algorithm, which demonstrated the value of deep RL at scale and the empirical study of the deadly tribe that I mentioned in the previous slide. So that's uh, actually all for, for me today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the usual link. And then uh, on the next lecture, Hannah is going to be talking about generalization in RL, which is a hugely interesting and important to topic, and that goes way beyond the issues on the deadly tribe that I discussed in this, uh, in this talk.